Uh, thank you everyone for being here, uh, whether present in the room or online. Uh, just as a reminder, this is uh, uh, the fourth session. Uh, we would like again to thank the Goethe Institute, uh, Ramallah Palestine for initiating this project, uh, the symposium and the book. Uh, it is funded by the Federal Foreign Office and this particular event here is funded by the Federal Agency for Civic Education. Um, after sessions um, yesterday and this morning about transculturality, uh, knowledge, documentation, archive, research, uh, protest, activism, we get now to the last session before the book event, the book launch that will be at six. This session is about renovation modernizing and updating modes of preservation, renewal and adaptive reuse of modern heritage. We will have uh, seven speakers. So we urge the speakers to be uh, limited with the time we gave them, which is 10 minutes so that we keep some time for uh, these very good debates we're having. Uh, and we will have a, a little stop after uh, uh, the first uh, four presentations. Uh, to start, initiate a little bit of a discussion, and then we will have a larger discussion after all is done. Our first speaker is Alessandra Peruzzetto from the World Monument Fund, and her uh, presentation is World Monument Fund and Modern Heritage. Alessandra is uh, at the World Monuments Fund since 2006. She is responsible of the MENA region. In the years, she developed and implemented projects focused on preservation site management planning, world heritage issues, training on cultural heritage conservation and management, and advocacy awareness. Specialized in Near Eastern archeology span from the University of Torino, prior to World Monuments Fund, she worked at Nimrud and Hatra in Iraq and in Turkmenistan. In Jordan, she worked for the Institut Francais du Proche Orient and for the Petra National Trust. Between 2012 and 2019, Alessandra also collaborated in the preparation of UNESCO World Heritage nomination files and of interpretation plans for World Heritage sites in Iraq and the Emirates. Uh, Alessandra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, George, for the introduction. And thank you also for uh, inviting me to this very interesting symposium. Thank you to the organizer. Good afternoon to everybody. And uh, let me share the screen. I'm sorry, I hope there are no noises. There are doing some work in the farm nearby. Um, first of all, I would like to briefly introduce uh, War Monuments Fund for the whom in the audience who don't know it, doesn't know it. So, War Monuments Fund. It's working. Yes. So, uh, War Monuments Fund is a private organization dedicated to the conservation, to the preservation of cultural heritage around the world. Uh, we are based in New York, but we have some affiliates in other countries. And since 1965, we worked in around 700 sites in distributed around 112 countries in the world. Uh, the projects could vary from conservation of cultural heritage to um, preparation of uh, planning documents, uh, capacity building uh, training, uh, capacity building activities, awareness campaign, etc. Um, and usually these projects are supported, implemented, or uh, uh, created together with the local actors. Local actors being these uh, the uh, local governmental institutions, uh, private uh, public institutions, or uh, uh, public or uh, private organizations, or as well uh, um, some association of the civil society. Um, World Monuments Fund, to go into the subject of this, uh, of this symposium, has uh, in the years developed three programs dedicated to uh, advocating for the protection of modern heritage. These two have been created in 2008 and are a modern, modernism at risk. We wanted to a program that raised awareness for the protection of iconic modern buildings or modern sites in risk. Through, and this one was done through advocacy campaign, through exhibition of case studies, uh, competitions, in one case in the preparation of a conservation master plan and of a training of uh, and training capacity for the maintenance and preservation of an iconic uh, historic site and modernist monocyte in the United States. 
unfortunately I say because we are speaking about the Arab country, no Arab, uh, no monuments from Arab country have been never considered in this uh, in this program. And uh, a second program that is still ongoing is the uh, is the Noel Modernist Prize. That since uh, 2008 and every two years recognizes architects and uh, uh, preservationists who acted for the preservation of an iconic building. So every two years there is an announcement so the project that uh, protected, the preserved, the rehabilitated the modern heritage site could uh, nominate themselves and can receive uh, this prize after a, sele a, a, a selection. So, um, if uh, you know, this one could be also now the project is closed for this year, but for the next campaign, I can also uh, inspire someone to uh, from the from the Arab region to propose. Al Alessandra, the, if, if yes. I may just interrupt yes. you for a second, yes. I'm sorry, we would like yes. you to speak a bit louder and a bit slower. Oh, sorry, okay, we'll give, you, we'll give you two more minutes, no worries. Okay, <laughs> sorry, Thank can you. you hear me better now? Yes, and, and yes. please, uh, a bit slower, yes, okay. Um, Maybe just also the microphone, if you can hold it's it. It's not near. Yes, I yeah, yeah. like that. Thank it's you. Better, probably. Okay, so um, so this I, I hope you you listen you hear what I'm saying. So these two programs for War Monuments Fund are the Modern at, Modern at Risk is an advocacy program dedicated for the protection for the uh, to advocate for the protection of sites that are at, that are at risk, and the Noel Modernist Prize that every year every two years is still ongoing uh, are present uh, sites that have been restored uh, are restored modernist sites that have been restored can present themselves for. Um, for for a support for receiving a prize that that that, uh, that is and this is done every two years in the two programs as I said before no sites from the Middle East have been ever nominated but this one can be an opportunity if uh, the, if you know some sites that were restored in the Middle East that could be nominated in the next uh, in the next round of the Nobel Prize and uh, the second the third program that was created in was a social media campaign that was launched in two thousand seventeen to involve the the public in a discussion for the protection of a modern heritage. And uh, during this campaign that is now closed, uh, around 300 sites were nominated, 10 of them were from the, from the Arab region. And one of those was, uh, we heard about it this morning, was the Tel du Lac as the image that I put also in this presentation. Uh, another program that advocate for the protection of cultural heritage in War Monument, at War Monuments Fund is the Watch, uh, the War Monuments Watch. Every two years, uh, uh, twenty-five sites, the number change along the years, uh, were are nominated for um, because they are at risk, because they need attention, because at risk. Uh, along the years, uh, different sites were nominated. Also, were uh, sites, sorry, sites and monuments uh, from modern architecture were nominated. And a few of them were also success. Some of them, they were just advocacy, pro advocacy. Uh, they were nominated for advocacy for protection. And in other cases, War Monuments Fund also intervened with really specific projects. And uh, two of them, one in India uh, recently, Patel Stadium, where Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan was prepared in collaboration with the local actors and supported by the Getty Foundation. And uh, in earlier in 2010, between 2010 and 2020, we work with the Miami uh, Marine Stadium in the United States. And here also structural feasibility was, uh, was prepared. The stadium was considered, so this is a success story because after this work, the stadium was considered safe and the, uh, the risk of demolition was, uh, was canceled. And now the stadium has, is ongoing. There is a project for renovation and it's, uh, it was listed in 2018, in uh, 2018 in the National Register of Historic Places historic places. Another project where uh, we worked was a, from a watch site was in New Gurna, where our Monuments Fund collaborated with UNESCO and the Luxor Governorate to prepare a community assessment that could integrate, could integrate the social and economic values in the planning, in the project planning. And this is, was part of a major project that was is major, mainly con, um, con, uh, implemented by UNESCO, a project that I know that recently started the game. To go um, more recently, more monuments fund 
is working on uh, two projects that, see, uh, that uh, connect to modern heritage. One was nominated, was mentioned yesterday by, uh, by Georges, is the preparation of roadmap to Lebanon heritage, to the Lebanon Le heritage inventory, the, to support the DGA to arrive to have this inventory. So as you can see, these are the 10 points that also Georges put yesterday in his slide. And then they see the, and the hope with the preparation of this roadmap to arrive to have uh, a budget that could, uh, could be presented later to donors for the preparation, the real, pre the, the real preparation of the inventory. And the second project what Monuments Fund is working on at the moment uh, concerning cultural modern heritage is the rehabilitation of the Mosul Cultural Museum in Iraq. Uh, the project is uh, um, implemented by other parts together with other partners. Each of us has a different uh, aspect of the project. There is the Louvre for the restoration of the object at the museography, the Smithsonian for, uh, the for training courses in the site in the museum management, the uh, Ali is the supporter of the project and the funder. And then this, this Iraqi State Board of Antiquities works with all of us in the different aspects of the project. Uh, War Monuments Fund in, specific, in, uh, in particular is working on the, on the rehabilitation of the building. We spent the last nine months in preparing the, um, the project, the restoration project, the concept design, and in the detail design. And we are now in the phase of, the, uh, of preparing the, the costing. Uh, the project has different our project, so this the physical rehabilitation of the Mosul Museum has different aspects. Uh, first of all, it, this one, as you know, the building was affected in 2000, was attacked in 2015 by ISIS. And is, uh, is now we can say the interior of the building, the building itself is a skeleton of a cement building. Uh, we have, and we work in this one at different levels. For sure, this one wants to be the rehabilitation of an important cultural place for or Mosul that will welcome again uh, objects of the cultural heritage of the national heritage of Iraq and, Mes and northern Mesopotamia, but also we want to be an example of rehabilitation of a modern building. In fact, uh, the Mosul Museum was, uh, was built, was designed in the late 60s by uh, architect Mohammed Makia and uh, built during uh, the early and completed in the early 70s. So um, part of the project saw also the, um, the, re the ev the evaluation of the values of these buildings. So, and this one was done also through the work of an heritage, to the creation of uh, the preparation of an heritage assessment that was prepared by Dr. Almina Al-Sad and that was also in, uh, in, the, in the audience in, the, in this symposium. And uh, um, it's because we want to really to, so we have, as I said, different levels. So we have the cultural uh, repository of the, of, uh, heritage of the culture of Iraq, but also uh, an important iconic place of the modernist, the modernist architecture of Iraq. Uh, the building, as I said, as I, I told you before, is really a skeleton of a, of a, of a, of a cement building. It's very is highly affected inside by the destruction. Here you see one of the hall, and you can see that where there is no electricity anymore. There is no piping. There is, a, there is just the structure itself, uh, structurally is safe, but there are some issues we need to be addressed. And what you can see here are the, what the remains of the objects that were before exposed inside the museum. Another level that we want to give to this, uh, to this project is uh, the involvement of the local community. The, we have to consider that the generation, the, the, gener the new generation of Iraq, the younger generation of Iraq, didn't go into this museum since um, few, at least 2000, uh, around the, the beginning of the second Gulf War. So this museum was not visited. The young generation don't know what there was inside. And so one of the activities, one of the things that we, want, we, we do during, we, we did and we will do also in the next years so during the rest of renovation of the, of the building, is trying to re-welcome um, re the people inside the museum. And we did it through a concert, uh, as you see in this slide on the, uh, on the left, and uh, with the young uh, musician from, uh, from Mosul and the public of Mosul getting back inside this destroyed building. This one is the conference hall where there is just really, there is nothing left apart from the cement walls, and uh, welcoming again some school to visit the building. Here you see one of the young, uh, young children 
that are back in in the museum. So to see, unfortunately, what is left now, but to try to think what there could be in the future. And another point that was very important for us is also to, and this one I connect myself to what Mona also said this morning about the memory of the war also in Beirut, and is what to leave uh, of what happened to this building. And, and we did this through a community outreach program with interviews of the local, of the local inhabitants of Mosul, of Mosul, but also heritage ex experts around Iraq to understand what they want, what they want to will be kept in the renovation process of what happened during uh, the ISIS attack, after the ISIS attack in 2015. Uh, the hole that you see here and that you saw at the beginning was uh, uh, the, the place of the throne hall from Nimrud that was dynamited by, uh, by ISIS and left this big hole. And it and that probably will stay because the people of Mosul want to keep the memory of the destruction. So, um, so these are the major projects that World Monuments Fund is doing now in the Middle East and in the Middle East for cultural, for uh, modern heritage, and the program that we have about modern heritage in, uh, in general at World Monuments Fund. Thank you very much. I hope you hear that. You heard that. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, our next speaker is Aziza Shauni, um, whose uh, panel or whose um, Sorry, the title of her talk is An Architect Engaging with the Past and Future of Sidi Harazm, Morocco. Aziza Shawni is an Associate Professor of Architecture at the University of Toronto, John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design. She is the founding principal of the design practice Aziza Shawni Projects with offices in Fez, Morocco and Toronto, Canada. In 2007, Shawni co-founded Dokomomo, Morocco. Shawni has rehabilitated several heritage buildings, including the Karawiyin Library, the oldest library in the Middle East. She is responsible for the conservation management plans for the Sidi Harazm Thermal Bath Complex and for the CICES, both supported by the Keeping It Modern grant from the Getty Foundation. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for the invitation, and uh, Alif uh, Mabrouk for the publication of the book. It's extremely timely. So I was asked to really keep to 10 minutes. I'm going to try to do it. I mean, my site is very large. It's 14 hectares, so please give me 12 minutes. So, um, you know, like I'm going to go through quickly the first part, which is about the history of Sidi Harazam. I'm sure you can read about it, hopefully, in the book chapter. But uh, so, so Sidi Harazam is a thermal bath complex. That's the largest public uh, leisure infrastructure structure built after Morocco's independence. It was commissioned in 1959 to Jean-Francois Zevaco, who's, um, I would say, a Moroccan architect of uh, Corsican origins, who was born, raised, and built more than 100 uh, buildings in Morocco. Uh, he's very often coined the uh, Niemeyer of, of North Africa, and I would really encourage you to look at more of his work. So why uh, did the young Moroccan state select um, Sidi Harazem as the site for its first uh, public leisure infrastructure? Well, because uh, the site is um, actually located uh, a few kilometers outside of my hometown of Fez. And uh, for years, uh, it has been, I mean, I would say since the uh, Roman time, it was like a thermal hot spring used, uh, but also for since the 11th century, a Sufi saint uh, called the Sidi Harazem, you can see its mausoleum here, sorry, uh, I guess. Oh, sorry, no, not here. That's my grandmother. Uh, it's right here. Uh, th that's not Sidi Harazam. Um, and so the hot spring actually emerges right near his tomb. And so many people, including my grandmother, that you can see here, uh, believed all her life that the hot spring would actually heal her uh, rheumatism. So actually I was uh, going with her every two, three months to Sidi Harazam, would stay there, she would drink the water, and then she would uh, bath there. And she strongly believed that she couldn't feel any pain after her uh, pilgrimage and stay at Sidi Harazam. And those are uh, some photos of me and her uh, next to the you know, oasis of Sidi Harazam. So you could see, you know, like on the, on the, the uh, background, the oasis. Uh, and uh, maybe this, you know, encounter with uh, like a modern masterpiece maybe made me like an architect, uh, who knows. But the complex is actually quite, you know, impressive. So it sprawls over uh, 14 hectares. I don't know where is the dot. Oh, yeah, it's here. So this is the uh, oasis of um, Sidi Harazam. The saint um, sa um, sanctuary is here uh, with the spring. And 
Zivaco decided uh, to actually push his 14-hectare uh, project here um, towards the, the south. And it's uh, comprised of an entrance plaza with the very beautiful entrance um, sculpture, a swimming pool, a hotel that's lifted on uh, pilotes, bungalows, uh, uh, a market. And the whole project is actually organized around a central Riyadh, which you can see here that Zivaco wrote on his plans. Its name was the uh, uh, Riyadh. And it was you know, like an obvious uh, reference to the main um, typology of housing in Morocco, which is the courtyard house, which you know, very often had, has a fountain in its middle. Uh, sorry, next. Next, yeah. And so, uh, so this is like a uh, photo taken by, by Zivaco himself from a helicopter, you know, like during the construction site. So you can see the entrance plaza still under construction, the hotel, the Riyadh, the market, and, and the bungalow. So the, the pool is actually nestled like at the bottom of a valley, and the river actually runs right here on its uh, lower side. Some photos of the Riyadh you could see was uh, used, you know, kind of to be filled with fountains and gardens and the market in the in the background. Uh, the, architecture, uh, the, arch the architecture of Zivaco is very often uh, integrated in a very beautiful and seamless manner with the landscape. And you could see here, for example, the stairs leading to, to the pool, uh, all built with in, uh, concrete. Next, uh, this is the hotel lifted on pilotes. And over the years, uh, as I've been visiting uh, the, the thermal bath, not knowing actually who was the architect until I went to graduate school in the US, I found out that it was Zivaco. And one uh, winter, I came back for the holidays when I was in graduate school. And this is what I found, that the uh, building who was still owned by the state uh, pension fund, who funded it in 1959, um, decided uh, since it was getting less and less people and the thermal complex started to become less and less uh, popular because Moroccans started to go to, to the beach, they decided to Moroccanize it. Uh, so thank God, they, it was like a student of Zivaco who got the job. He didn't demolish uh, any walls, but what he did, uh, what, this is what I call makeup, uh, let's say rehabilitation. So it just covered the, the surfaces with, uh, you know, kind of different type of materials, of traditional materials. So. Um, I had no choice in a certain way, but to wear the hat of, you know, the activist. So this is what you've seen, you know, this morning. I'm not going to the, de the detail of that. But the uh, Moroccan state uh, 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 pension fund has tried to sell the entire complex um, several times. It almost struck a deal with the Chinese company. But at the end, it was too expensive to demolish the complex. And so the deal thankfully fell through. And this is when I showed up and uh, I asked if I could apply with them to the Getty Foundation, keeping a modern grant which we got after uh, you know, like a lot of efforts. And the, so this in a way was the seeds to the rehabilitation plan. And that was composed of this uh, four phases, data collection, raising awareness, diagnosis, solutions, and the, and, and, and the actual work, which I'm going to be focusing on. So very quickly to, to, to give you a context about uh, Sidi Harazam, uh, it emerged at a moment where, when uh, the young Moroccan state, like we've seen in the case of Lebanon and you know, Kuwait, et cetera, wanted to establish its new identity with concrete and with progress. And one of the area where this architecture really got deployed and was a laboratory, actually, where young Moroccan architects were asked uh, in 1960 to reconstruct the city of, you know, of Agadir. And this is, again, another unknown gem uh, in Morocco. The entire city was uh, re uh, rebuilt in this, you know, fantastic language. And um, Zivaco was actually part of this uh, rebuilding effort. He has like several buildings, and one of them is one of my favorite is the post office. And um, Zivaco actually uh, de departed uh, somehow from his uh, colleagues of, of the time. He was seen almost as an outcast because his architecture was deemed too uh, lyrical, too sculptural, uh, too Brazilian even, uh, some of them said. And some motifs started to emerge in his architecture that we can find in Sidi Harazem. So Sidi Harazem was used in a way as a, you know, as a testing ground uh, for him. And we see that certain elements reappeared in other projects, like, for example, here here, this very sculptural uh, columns. We can see here in Sidi Harazem four different types of columns. 
uh, that appeared. Another motif are the stairs that are uh, suspended. Uh, those are the suspended stairs of Sidi Harazan. It took us with the firm in New York uh, three months to understand how the stabilization system worked. Um, like the uh, like a lot of his buildings were lifted on, on pilotis so that like a public shaded uh, plaza can be um, created. And this is also the case in Sidi Harazan. And finally, his house, which I found was telling a lot about his approach and his own uh, personality. His house, unfortunately, despite our effort at the Kamama Morocco, was demolished. Uh, and so you see its gates that almost look like, you know, some cacti. Uh, he didn't want, he was a very, you know, introverted uh, person. Uh, and um, and this is the plan. And you can see that water. So, so this was his office and this was his home. And water, which is here in the pool, but inside his living room, he had water and also like a planter. So uh, landscape, you know, like uh, very often got, you know, uh, invited inside his architecture. You can see here also how, you know, kind of water weave itself through uh, his architecture. And in Sidi Harazam, so this was one, I mean, again, I'm not going to go into the detail of the archives, etc. but the archives were in three different places, were incomplete, were flooded. So we had to do a lot of the measurements ourselves on 14 hectares. It took us uh, three years, but uh, we reassembled all the information. And one of the drawings that's very dear to my heart is to reconstruct the whole water system of Sidi Harazam that was designed by, uh, by Zivako. And water is always appears at any moment. I mean, you know, I do remember, you know, like when I was young, you know, in any place I would go, I would hear water flowing. So even within the stairs, you have the small cracks and the blue Zelige of Fez would, you know, after mark uh, the, the passage of water. And this is the, the famous pool with its 20 meter can deliver um, canopy. Also, this is my time. My time is over. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> uh, exactly. So very quickly. So so you see here the the, the pool. Uh, sorry, the the pool that when it was uh, you know like at the end every two days would overflow into this laguna here, and a cafe used to open up. So uh, two minutes. So the pool actually is very uh, reminiscent of a, a traditional technique to to catch water in Morocco. And one last thing, you know, like an an untold story of, of modernism is uh, one in which the local population was actually moved from the site uh, uh, nearby. And uh, we were you know, like able to find you know, some people that still have some memory of this uh, the, um, the, um, the displacement. So this woman, Zahra, for example, returned once to the modern site. And she said that this is you know, a facility not for us, it's for other people. She means other people from the rest of Morocco. And so there is still a lot of uh, resentment within the, the population. And this is actually the site plan that we assembled that did not really you know, exist. And you see here that uh, some buildings in light orange were phase two, were never built. Among them, the, the spa. And the fact that the complex never had a spa uh, is one of the reasons why it actually failed you know, for, for over time. So very quickly raising awareness, I'm not gonna go into the detail, but we did like a, a Facebook campaign that's proven very popular and we received actually a lot of the ancestors of the selfie. I mean, those are quite you know, incredible and give us information on some areas of the site where we didn't have any information. We did a lot of different games with the children's and youth to understand this was actually very popular. It's the treasure hunt of the Zivaco columns. Uh, informal surveys uh, since the, the, the complex actually closed down, there was an emergence of an informal market and uh, peddlers also that started, you know, kind of to sell things. And uh, since uh, most of the people there could not read, we developed this you know, questionnaire with uh, pictograms. And the most popular thing was a board game uh, to help us define the master plan. So this was actually extremely important because the state uh, pension fund wanted to create a five-star resort, uh, resort gated. Uh, and so uh, we were obviously you know, against it. It took a lot of time to explain that this is a very popular destination, that the water is still seen as very holy. And so we integrated, I mean, they thought it was crazy, uh, but we pushed, pushed, pushed until actually we had the, the local population and people in the market uh, contribute to, to the definition of the master plan, the result of the different workshops. And another tool that's proven very helpful, we trained young girls to become you know, of architecture to, uh, tour guides, we you know, invited uh, young artists of Morocco that never been actually to, to the site quickly. Um, an exhibition in, in, in Rabat where people discovered the site, where we actually asked them to vote on the different programs. 
uh, Instagram, they're welcome to go to ZCD Harazam a website where you can find all of the research, ZCD Harazam Station. And one of the things that we're, that we're very uh, proud of is we were able to have the voices of Sidi Harazam. So if oral history is also here present, a uh, symposium that uh, George and Khaldun uh, came to uh, that also has its website, sorry, publication, sorry, I know a lot of things, but just, uh, just very quickly. So this is, is the type of drawing we did for the rehabilitation that mark all the different type of damage. Uh, and for the CMP, so for the conservation management plan, what was essential was for us to develop a new concept for the thermal bath, uh, because the thermal season was actually very short and the local population you know, needed work. So we defined after like a lot of debate, three different uh, programs, SPA, uh, Culinary School and Education Center for Architecture, teamed up with the local um, architecture school. Uh, and what we had to do also, which is something that the government was not willing to do, and we work with them on, on a business plan on what would be the different source of income to fund this uh, rehabilitation and came actually the difficult part was to pass, to pass, you know, uh, bylaws to protect the actual landscape of the site, because it's in a very rural landscape that's close by to a city, so it could have developed. So this would have been actually quite successful because this became the different zoning became like a bylaw so this we're very uh, proud of and so that we could also we started to define different colors of different uh, priority of buildings high significance high significance and and uh, moderate significance for the master plan sorry and within you know each building we did the, the same thing what are the components that we absolutely have to preserve and finally this is the uh, master plan that we came up with and what you would see in light green are the new buildings so one of the first thing we did is that we got rid of all of the additional uh crap sorry that were you know added you know over time uh, thankfully they were temporary um, and the uh, um, phase one of the project, I don't know who scribbled here, not me, um, but uh, was to start with these three uh, buildings. So, so the spa was the element of the thermal station that was not needed, uh, th that was actually the most needed th that we added here, and a market that would house all of the informal market th uh, that you know, emerged very quickly. So the first thing is that we had to rehouse the, um, the, the stall market uh, people. So this we were, you know, able to, you know, achieve first, that was like the necessity before we start the restoration, we had to rehouse them. So we built some fun uh, stalls with them that were meant to be temporary. The entrance plaza, which you can see here, all of the original water network uh, was not functioning. These very ugly tiles have been added. And uh, this is, I know I have to end. Those are the plans for the re rehabilitation. And this is how we would look like. Uh, COVID started and then uh, we had to, to stop. Here is the market very quickly. I don't have time to get you know, into it, but this is uh, the new market. The, the spa, I don't have time to, to, uh, to get to it. And finally, mm -hmm. the market where we house the exhibition past, present and future that we had. So you can see here, and just very quickly, just to, to, to let you know, there are um, three things that happen after we finish the conservation management plan. I know I have to finish. Flood, fire, and coronavirus. Uh, and so what we did, so the flood allowed us to make the market happen faster. Uh, and we launched this artist residency. I know I have to finish, but actually, you know, what I have to show you is the fact just, this is just, uh, you know, like a, maybe something I want to share, you know, with everyone, what has worked the most for our raising, uh, you know, awareness about this modern heritage was inviting this rapper that, that I didn't know. I'm too old actually to know him. His name is Shobi. And he actually made like a video clip here. And then he wrote a song. And to the point where the government also started to say, wow, look, there is our most famous rapper. He did a song and he did more than all of our efforts actually to make the site more well known. Uh, and we developed uh, an art walk where we invited several artists to uh, propose, you know, kind of different uh, projects. And we've been using the site as a cultural uh, site where we have classical music and dance and so forth. So I won't get into the, the detail of this. I just want to end with, with uh, the, the, the video, please, uh, of, of the dance. Uh, maybe like at the end, you, you can see it How because uh, it's one minute. 
if you want, or you can show it at the end, because I think for me, that was one of the most beautiful uh, outcome is to if invite you mind, young Moroccan we, artists. If you don't mind, we can show it at the end. I can show it at the end, yes. To be it, fair it, it's everybody. called yeah. Hulm. Yes, I'd I'm so sorry. Conversation. I am so sorry, but no, no, it's uh, okay. that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next, our next speaker is Layla al uh, and she will uh, speak about the case of New Gurna, by, uh, by Hassan Fathi uh, in Egypt. So uh, Layla Al-Wakil holds an MA in art history, an MA in architecture, and a PhD in history of architecture, all from the University of Geneva. She has taught the history of architecture and heritage conservation in Geneva, Neuchâtel, Hanoi, Bechar, and Cairo, and has participated in many international conferences. Layla has published extensively on Swiss, European, and Arab architecture of the 19th and 20th century. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Does it work? Yeah. It's a real pleasure to add. It's a real pleasure to attend this conference in presence here in Berlin, particularly in the pregnant oyster, a very iconic modern building. I am grateful to George and Philip and uh, also Shireen Abdu Abu Ramadan, who did a great job coordinating the book, which shall launch in a few moments and keeping us in touch during the pandemic. Addressing New Gurna, Hassan Fathi's iconic model village in the context of a general study of modern Arab architecture could seem quite a paradox. Second one. Hassan Fathi used to repeat as in the lecture given in Beirut in 1972, la contemporaneité en architecture arabe moderne, first of all, it must be said that there is no such thing as contemporary Arab architecture, but only modern Western architecture in Arab countries. His original theory around the concept of Arab contemporaneity is based on the idea of a reconnection with the Arab architectural tradition before international influence, which after him interrupted the normal course of architectural development in the Arab world. Generally classified as a new traditionalist, sometimes at a postmodern, Fatri calls for a return to traditional Arab formal, typological and constructive processes pushing back the Western colonial modernity imported into the Arab world that he considers inappropriate to the place. To remedy this, what he proposes to produce a contemporary Arab architecture based on a detailed knowledge of sources, history, building archeology, span traditional technologies, and local know-how. But his incredible fame arose from the story of New Gurna, a model village built on the west bank of Luxor. When Fatri was commissioned to design the model village of Gurna to relocate the Gurnis, he was at the peak of his career. Next one. A new flat land of 50 acres surrounded by dikes is found where Fatri draws the master plan of the model village determined by sociological and practical data. Driven by a picturesque aesthetic, Fatri aims to create a village with a complex layout which gives the impression of having been benefited from time as a building material. The deliberately irregular fabric of the village demands an imaginative response and a rich and varied architecture. Fatri designed model farm project from the early of the 40s, the preparatory designs for Gurna's project within the context of the reform of the Egyptian countryside. Next one. He tested the raw bricks technology in the Abu Ragab farm for Bartim, an experiment of the Royal Society of Agriculture in 1940 and refined his technology with the help of the know-how of Nubian stonemasons. In Esbet El Basri Farm, 1945, he uses the proven technique of the mud brick as it has been passed down from generation to generation in the Aswan region. 
Next one. He develops his own method dictated by the priority concern of the economy and uses a traditional technology of raw brick. Next one. Raw earth costs nothing, is easily available, and can be shaped with a wooden frame. It is a kind of degree zero of technology available to anyone. Next one. After several attempts to rediscover the ancestral technology of mud brick, uh, that was still in practice in Harbaswan. Uh, he tried to re reconstruct the, the village in this technology. Their masons are still capable of building mud bricks, arches, and domes. For Gurna, he decided to bring masons from Aswan to reintroduce the technology of Nubian vote in, in Luxor and teach it to the Gornis so that they could build their houses themselves. For all the building, Fatri adopts a mixed technique that places the raw brick on a few courses of cut stone. The structure is then coated with a northern plaster that erases the somewhat rough aspect of the material to leave only the clear and geometric play of volumes accentuated by the cast of shadows. Next one. Surprisingly, the spirit of purity and simplicity of the forms is close to that of the modern movement, such as it is established in the Western world. And if the Nubian votes recall the parabolic votes of the Western engineers, next one, the dome and the, on the other hand, by opposing the flat roof of the modern movement, next one, is a signature that underlines the traditional ka'a of the Arab Muslim world. New Gurna was only partly realized for reasons of bureaucratic inertia, reluctance of the Gurni, and an underground boycott of heavy technologies lobbies. The initial project was much more ambitious. In 1947, there was a sabotage of the village under construction. The rupture, next one, of the dikes, which retained the water of the Nile floods, flooded the village, causing damage to the mud structures. The flood marked the stop and the political abandonment of the project. The business turned into a fiasco and threw Fatri into a dead end. The critical weight of Fatri Ghanim's 1959 novel, the mountain, which appeared immediately after Fatri had left Egypt for Athens and was later brought to the screen, certainly served to reinforce negative views of New Gurnas in Egypt. In Architecture for the Poor, Fatri described the flooding caused by the Gurnis in 1947, the lasting damage caused to the construction and the political abandonment of the project. In 19 49, he wrote a letter to the Dean of the School of Fine Art in Cairo, asking him to arrange collaboration with the students to complete the village. Countless documents in Arabic refer to endless attempts to find a new direction and a new use. Tourism seemed a plausible solution with New Gurna being transformed into a touristic village. You can see this uh, on the projects uh, on the screen. After the founding by Fatri of the Institute of Appropriate Technology in 1976, the idea of making it into an international laboratory for the practice of mud brick architecture took hold. Then I am coming to restoration. Finally, <laughs> coming to the recent chapter of the conservation of New Gurna, I propose to tell you about the actions undertaken since 2008. I have never been able to dissociate my activity as a researcher from that of a preservationist. In parallel with the research carried out in the inexhaustible collection of Hassan Fati archives at IUC and at the Agapor Foundation, I have created with Egyptian colleagues and friends in Geneva an association called 
Save the Heritage of Hassan Fati. We published a blog reporting the continual degradation of the village that you can see on the pictures here. And um, we, we visited the village in successive on-site uh, visits between 2000 and 2011. During a visit sponsored by the Agacan Foundation in company of a representative of Crater, a famous French atelier specialized in urban building, it was in 2009, we discovered the construction site of a new public building in concrete on the Esplanade uh, that uh, Fatri uh, created for a feast, as you can see on the picture at the bottom, and it is just behind the theater. The militant action of the association, the letters and visits made to the Egyptian authorities, in particular to the Minister of Antiquities, Zahi Hawass, participation in scientific conferences devoted to urban architecture, all of this ended in some results. One day, I received an email from Francesco Bondarin, the director of UNESCO World Heritage Center, asking me to attend a meeting in Paris. This was fruitful since UNESCO decided to commit to the preservation of Burna. In October 2011, an international mission of experts was organized on site. The World Monument Fund was involved. And I remember the bus, mostly made up of Westerners, escorted by Egyptian police, which entered the main square in Burna in a heat wave. In 2012, the revolution stopped the project. In the meantime, some private initiatives has emerged. You can see the last picture. Well, no, this is the project of the World Monument Fund for uh, Gourna. And uh, the private initiative, you can see them on the last plate. And uh, some owners decided to reinvent Hassan Fatih's typologies, which alter the original substance. On the left, uh, you can see a fired brick second floor uh, invented by the owner. And on, on the right, you can see uh, the addition, the, the, we can call that a Disneylandization. <laughs> of uh, the Hassan Fatri house with even the addition of a dove coat in the courtyard. Nevertheless, the story of the restoration of New Gurna continues in the hope of saving the trace of this exceptional unfinished experiment. Since 2017, the Tarek Wali Center is in charge with the rehabilitation of the center of New Gurna village. Work is going ahead on the public monuments located around the square, especially the Khan, the theater, and the mosque. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Monal Musfi, who is joining us online. Um, her talk title is The Renovation and Adaptive Reuse of the Flying Saucer in Sharjah. Monal Musfi is an architect and the founder of Space Continuum, a research-based architecture practice that explores the relation between space, shared social practices, and sociocultural conditions. Musfi is the advisor to the Sharjah Architecture Triennial and played a key role in the founding and founding the initiative in 2017. She is currently engaged in various adaptive reuse projects, leading a team of architects at the Sharjah Art Foundation and the Sharjah Architecture Triennial. Her most recent renovation and adaptive reuse project is the Flying Saucer. She has previously taught at the College of Architecture, Art and Design at the American University of Sharjah, where she held a full-time position from 2002 to 2014. Mona, I hand it over to you. I think the presentation. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation, George and Philip, and thank you, Sarah, Shireen, for your very kind support. Uh, so this presentation is on the renovation and adaptive use of a resilient 70s modern building, the so-called uh, Flying Saucer in Sharjah, United Arab Emirates. I was involved in the last cycle of restoration and, and renovation, 2018 to 2020 with the Sharjah Art Foundation team. As recently discovered, 
Uh, this uh, building was designed by the Egyptian architect Ali Nur al-Din Nassar and allegedly commissioned by Ahmed al-Qasimi, a prominent cultural actor in Sharjah prior to the 80s. That is before Sharjah shifted toward a more conservative cultural programming. A 2018 survey has shown that Sharjah are attached to the saucer, its presence, and they support its conservation. They value the iconic quality of the building and its surprising adaptability and participation in the urban life of the surrounding neighborhood for over four decades. Space Continuum has collaborated with the foundation to renovate and repurpose the building as an art center. It reopened to the public on September 2020 with the aim of fostering gathering, learning, and creativity, and to further integrate the saucer in the daily life of Sharjan. An aspect of the resilience of the flying saucer probably stems from the optimism of its silhouette that it expresses. It's the space age influence of Western 60s and 70s pop culture are evident in its design. Surprisingly, in 1978, the same year of its opening, the sighting of UFOs in the region were reported in Kuwait Times and Arab Times newspaper. Prior to the building openings, three advertisements in the local newspaper used the metaphor of the flying saucer to set the tone for the project futuristic ambition. In Al Khalish time on December 15, 1978, the first advertisement announces along with a futuristic abstract drawing that the flying saucer will be soon landing in Sharjah. It was followed by a second one that reads, the flying saucer will be landing in Sharjah tomorrow, Khalish time, 1978. And a more detailed advertisement lists what a visitor can treat himself to at, at the restaurant. Shifting context and urban, urban resilience. Since 1976, when it was an isolated building on a roundabout to the present, the saucer smoothly adapted to shifting context, attesting to its urban resilience. In 2008, the site underwent substantial transformation and until 2010, access was severe due to the construction of Al Wahda Bridge. The saucer is now sitting at the intersection of four residential neighborhoods, Dasman, Ramla, Yarmouk, and Al Ghubayba, and two congested roads and a flyover. The intention of the 2020 urban adaptation that I was involved in is to enhance the approach to the saucer that was sort of slightly overpowered by this flyover and create a new urban space dubbed the platform anchoring it on the site uh, around the saucer and replacing the old parking space. So this platform uh, acts as a kind of spatial and programmatic, uh, wants to act as a spatial and programmatic extension of the building. Hence it's used as a play, public gathering place and to stage outdoor art exhibition, performances and events. Programmatic and architecture adaptability. Uh, sorry, because these, uh, these drawings are, are not very clear, but that's what we uh, uh, received very recently. So actually from 1978 to the present, the saucer adapted to a series of programmatic changes combined with the ensuing architecture and interior transformation by successive tenants. The building initially housed a short-lived one-stop concept store with a restaurant, patisserie, tobacconist, and newspaper stand. It was operated by a renowned and eccentric French pastry chef, Gérard Raymond. The set of concept drawing that we received on April 2021 showed that one-fourth of the peripheral blades were enclosed in the initial design. The saucer remained empty for many years before reopening as Al Maya Lal Supermarket in 1988. An independent annex was, was built adjacent to the saucer and used for, by Life Pharmacy. Uh, and in 1998, a new tenant, Sharjah Cooperative Supermarket, renovated the building and expanded the display area and increased the facade openness. Despite or possibly because of the utmost simplicity of the party, the saucer was adaptable to a range of programs, tenants, and transformation. The most pronounced transformation were undertaken by 
a fast food restaurant, Al Taza Chicken Restaurant, that occupied it between 2008 and 2015. They included on the exterior cladding of the, the pillar and the canopy with aluminum panels and connecting the freestanding annex to the building. On the interior, a false ceiling that hit the concrete dome was installed and a series of foot and glass partition were fixed on this, in the saucer space. 2015 presents a turning point for the building as its new operator is now the Sharjah Art Foundation venue, a cultural institution, not a commercial one as the first uh, four ones were. So the first saucer occupation was during Sharjah Biennial 12, 2015, with Hassan Khan's site-specific installation, UFO, UFO. To house the UAE contribution to the 56th Venice Biennial uh, exhibition, actually it's an exhibition that was in Venice that was uh, re-shown in the UAE, and also Robert Breer's solo exhibition in 2016, Space Continuum, uh, and SAF uh, took the first step of reversing the transformation that led to the erasure of the building modernist character. The structure was stripped back to its core form by removing the aluminum cladding on its pillar and canopy and by taking down all false ceiling and interior partition. These actions revealed on the interior an intricate imbrication of the building with its now gutted attached annex. It also revealed the building a magnificent roof and facade structure. The 7.3 meter high central circular dome with 16 peripheral subspaces fanning around it. They are defined by concrete beams running overhead and supported by an inner circular beam and an outer peripheral beam along the facade. It turned, in turn, this beam rests on 16 ta tapered and tilted V shaped pillar, creating a complex three dimensional structure diagram. In the latest 2020 renovation, the saucer is brought back to its original silhouette and the new underground venue dubbed the launch pad was conceived to complement it both, its, uh, uh, to complement it spatially and programmatically. The removal of its incongruous connected anus reinforces the openness and perceptual lightness of the interior and a fully glazed facade allow for a 360 degree panoramic view. It also restored the radial symmetrical shape of the building, helping to further appreciate its structure. The dome was uh, kept in this rough exposed concrete finish. Uh, and it was its, its existing condition. And to allow for an uncluttered interior space in the saucer, the AC ducts were installed under the concrete floor with peripheral grills along the saucer facade. The new underground venue, dubbed the launch pad, always to keep with the space theme, was conceived to complement the saucer, both spatially and programmatically. In contrast with the saucer, the launch pad fluid spatial geometry mirrors the new urban space, dubbed the platform. It fans around the saucer, faceted retaining wall, and extend to the periphery of the site. Enclosed all around by white stained fair face concrete wall that give it a rough textural expression, it has limited outside view and receives some amount of daylight from the circular sunken courtyard, but also from in a glass encased stair that you can see in this uh, image and three linear skylight along its periphery. The launch pad is intended as a community space that fulfills cultural and social function. It houses a multi-purpose cafe overlooking the circular courtyard and holds multiple program and activities, an extensive curated library, workshops, readings, and film screening. Along the library wall, the long tables and chairs double as working and workshop space, and closer to the cafe counter and the faceted saucer, saucer walls, there are some swivel chairs that can be arranged around low table for visitors to socialize, while enjoying the cafe food and food. Uh, and they can also be spun around to face the faceted uh, saucer walls that double as creating walls. In conclusion, the flying saucer unique character allowed it to adapt to various occupants without losing its identity and essential formal feature. Its history speak of the adaptability and multifaceted resilience of an iconic modern building that has undergone layers of changes and transformation from 1975 to the present, 
by four different commercial entity and a cultural entity. Its resilience has enriched its history, allowing it to continue to be a landmark for local and city residents and to be inscribed in the place identity of Sharjah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mona, for this presentation. So now we will open, if you want, a session of uh, comments, questions, uh, and so on. And after that, we will have the last three speakers, so be patient with us. Uh, anybody has a question or a comment to start with? Ah, the video, yes, yes, the video, Aziza's video. Okay. Does it have sound or anything? No, let's keep it. Okay, let's. Okay. So this was a, uh, so was a hip hop uh, company that works with uh, youth from shanty towns of Casablanca and teach them hip hop that we invited to come to Sidi Harazam on a residency. So uh, when COVID hit the whole, uh, you know, comp we stopped the uh, re rehabilitation and I asked government if you can press play. And we asked, I asked the government if we could use the, the space. So during the whole of COVID, we invited a set of young Moroccan artists to stay in the hotel. The hotel is like the Shining Hotel with Jack Nicholson, actually. Uh, and we invited also chefs to cook uh, also and the local population to contribute. And Ishtah also included the local youth also to dance with them. So this is the video, if it plays. Can you press play? very much this uh, this will be one of the highlights of this <laughs> meeting thank you um, I can already react a little bit to what we heard uh, today I have a question for Alessandra are you with us yes okay I have a question about the Mosul uh, Museum yes. uh, the question is uh, who initiated this uh, idea of the of the restoration who was behind it who's the agency the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage, that is the, the owner of the building, it's a, which is the Minister of Culture in Iraq. 
Uh, and then and it I, was supported by Alif. The, the funds are coming from Alif. Okay, okay. So uh, I have also uh, for Aziza a question about this idea of uh, act activating uh, a place like that in order for it to uh, continue living until something substantial is done with the restoration and so on. And also, um, when you showed us that uh, old lady that said this is not the project for us, this is often the case. I mean, we have also in Lebanon the Tripoli Fair. Since its inception, a lot of people from Tripoli say you expropriated our land to build this, what you call this masterpiece of whatever architecture. It doesn't mean anything to us. It didn't bring any development to the city. Uh, people are even more alienated from it now because they cannot even visit unless they have a wasta or something. So uh, what is it that can be actually done for the long term to not only preserve the place, but bring it back to the people that deserve it and not only you know, intellectual people who may be interested in that sort of architecture, well, how to do it? Um, you know, like, uh, I think for me, it's been a very nice discovery to see that once you engage uh, with the local population that are not, you know, architects that uh, very often they're not, you know, even have like a formal, you know, education and you start to explain why the space is beautiful uh, to take them around to in a way, talk to them about the what makes the, the architecture so unique. I was very actually surprised to see how, uh, let's say, uh, open how, you know, kind of the, their eyes started to read this space that they've been using uh, on a daily basis sometimes. Part of it they, where they never entered because like the Tripoli Fair it was just, you know, close to them. So to make them enter and, and actually, I think it takes time. You know, I mean, we started the project in 2017. And I think to build the relationship of trust with, with the local population to, to explain why this project, that it was not a violent act to build in concrete in such gigantic scale, that it was within, I would say, like a political narrative of, you know, of independence. And I think I was very surprised to, to actually, I mean, I had a bias. I had a bias that the local population would not be able to understand the architecture of Zivaco, uh, you know, or its aspirations, but actually I was wrong. Uh, from, you know, other people to younger people, I think what was important was to initiate a dialogue, to understand what was the concern, to hear actually that the population felt spoiled, they were living in an oasis where they said, you know, dates fell from the, uh, you know, like from the sky and they had water and they were all happy and had agricultural and they were moved on, on, on a hill. So this, let's say, they really saw it as a very violent act. And this is a history of modernism that we rarely talk about. And it's, it's the same thing with the fracture place. So I think having an ear for them in we voicing their concern to, to develop the master plan together with them. This has been a fight against the local authorities, but we succeeded and making them part of the process at every step of the way and to integrate their needs. And that's why the market was so essential to build a temporary market while we are cleaning up that entrance and building a new market. So it was very important symbolically for it to be the first move, not the rehabilitation of something, but to build because their market actually burned down because of electrical, you know, Thanks. Okay, thank you. I have uh, also a uh, comment about uh, Leila's presentation when, uh, uh, I mean, this, this quote uh, about architecture and there's no uh, contemporary Arab architecture and uh, only modern Western architecture. Uh, now this idea of, of contemporary Arab architecture and not contemporary architecture in the Arab world is already the problem. I, I don't think we would uh, to continue a conversation we had already, I, I don't think we would think of writing a book about uh, modern German architecture. You would say maybe, Philip, modern architecture in Germany, right? Even though nationalism exists, I mean, or whatever. So, so this, uh, this idea of uh, producing an architecture that is the, the essential, the quintessential thing of a place um, is in itself, I think, a, a problem because when you when you place identity at the foreground as you are designing, you you don't let identity appear normally and naturally, uh, and all the ingredients around that identity come, maybe partly from the nationality of the architect. To continue also a conversation we had before, but it could be an architect that is not from the place but that understands the place understand the needs, the conditions, the climate, the, the, the building code, the practices, the desires, aspirations, all of these that make architecture. So the 
I think the, 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 the comment or the quote of uh, the lack of existence of an uh, Arab architecture for me is not a problem in itself. There's no need for an Arab architecture, I think. Well, what Hassan Fathi meant, and I think we, we can generalize, generalize the purpose, um, we can agree that modernity cut uh, a, a certain flow of history of architecture with new materials, new structures, new methods, new programs, and uh, especially uh, in the Arab world, uh, at the beginning, there was no connection between modern architecture and the, the, the Arab traditions of building houses and, uh, and uh, also um, uh, every kind of buildings, you know. So it, it is this interruption that Hassan Fathi was uh, claiming against because he wished that uh, uh, without this interruption, uh, the tra traditional architecture in Arab world could have evolved in something new, newer, modern, but modern Arab. I don't know if I express my thing yeah. <laughs> fully, completely. Uh, in any case, I'm very happy we have, we have Fathi within the book on modern architecture because he's being rediscovered uh, with, for many reasons uh, that are very timely. Uh, my last quick comment before I open to, to the others is the idea of uh, uh, the, this project in, uh, in Sharjah where, where you, you renovate by stripping a building by returning it to uh, its origin or to its sort of skeleton, that uh, skeleton quality that it has. Um, I think is, is a good uh, good example of uh, what one can do. So we have a question here in the audience, please. Um, yes, um, I would like to pose maybe not a question, but uh, kind of to, um, um, to, to eject some reactions. And it's the question of use. So um, especially for the projects which are um, which were devoid of their original functions, and for example, the ones that we managed to save and um, um, and preserve, because the question of use is quite tricky. So on the one hand, we um, uh, like the trend is to dedicate them to cultural uses, but um, uh, but it could be kind of elitist and gentrifying for the um, um, for the building itself. On the other hand, for example, I was um, quite intrigued by seeing the um, uh, spaceship, space saucer, transformed into Taza's chicken. Of course, that's the extreme of the other case, which kind of you can't see the building for the chicken. But on the other hand, it's, it was placed in, uh, in the public use. So a lot of people visited, maybe they were not aware of uh, the importance of the building, but um, um, they were there. It was used by hundreds of people every day. So, um, of course, there is no answer for that, but maybe uh, some reflections on the issue. Yeah, I think there are a few comments in the audience, but maybe it's better if we take like the next three presentations and then open a larger discussion at the end, only for the sake of time. So maybe I jump and introduce our next speaker. Um, Khaldun Pshado. I just try to collect all my papers here. Have it. Sorry, I think it's missing. I can present myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, I find it. I find it. Don't worry. I found it. No, no, no. Sorry about this. <laughs> It's my paper mess. So Khaldun Pshada is going to be presenting on the Riwak Center for Architectural Conservation. Khaldun Pshada is an architect, restorer, and anthropologist. He is the director of Riwak Center in Ramallah, where he has worked since 1994 in documenting, protecting, and restoring built Palestinian heritage. He received his BSc in architectural engineering from Birzeit University and his MA in conservation of historic towns and buildings from the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. Interested in refugee space and memory, he enrolled in the University of California, Irvine, where he obtained his MA in anthropology in 2009 and his PhD in 2012. Uh, Pshada carried out many architectural design and architectural restoration projects in Palestine. He is also the editor of Rewalk's monograph series on architectural history of Palestine and the author or co-author of a number of books and 
articles, which I won't list now and just hand over to Thank him. you. I, I would add one clarification that I uh, no longer reward director because I was director between 2010 and 2020 because we believe with the peaceful transition of power in Palestine, <laughs> excluding our president. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, George. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, uh, Goti, uh, Shireen, Mona, everybody who was uh, part of this uh, symposium and part of the publication of the wonderful book that we will uh, come to see this afternoon. Uh, my presentation will be about Rewalk because Rewalk is an NGO uh, functions in Palestine and uh, our aim is to document, uh, protect and restore uh, heritage of Palestine. This is our rewalk, our veranda. And uh, I will take you on a trip. Uh, Palestine is uh, cursed and blessed with the multitude of cultural heritage uh, that we have. We have monuments, religious uh, and uh, secular. Uh, we have cities from Nazareth North, Jerusalem, Naples, Jaffa, Acre, the harbor, uh, we have monasteries, Byzantine monasteries everywhere in the wilderness. Uh, we have more than 10,000 archaeological sites, some of them fully excavated, some of them partially excavated, some of them are looted. Uh, we have more than 400 villages still existing in the West Bank uh, and Gaza Strip. Uh, these are of variety of uh, sizes, some of them are 50 historic buildings, some of them are more than 1,100 historic buildings. We have lots of uh, agricultural structures in the fields. These are what we call the Malatir or Kosur Mazara, uh, where we gather the stones, cultivating the land and building a wash tower. And we in Palestine, we applied all the technologies at hand. We were in the center of the world, believe it or not. Uh, so we have all the techniques, mural paintings, mosaics, wood, uh, different traditions entering into the scene. So I will uh, start now with the state of preservation of uh, heritage in Palestine. And I uh, built this uh, title, which is called Colonial Legacy and Postcolonial Discourse, which is part of one of the papers that I published, uh, trying to talk about how we are trapped in our terms, and these terms are Eurocentric heritage discourses that still influencing our takes to heritage. And I will show why this is uh, important in our presentation. But we can define uh, two phases in history in Palestine. Uh, of course, the Nakba is important, the destruction of Palestine and the emerging of Israel. But for me, is Oslo Agreement 1993 can be considered the ultimate Nakba of Palestine uh, when uh, really in this post colonial, call it a new colonial, whatever its system is, a, uh, heritage is not acknowledged as a priority for the national authority. Uh, Ministry of Antiquities and uh, Tourism, plus the Ministry of uh, Culture in Palestine, they constitute half percent of the Palestinian budget, while 33% goes to the security. Okay, so value is not recognized because the land price in Palestine is so high, so it's better to dig down the building, the historic building, and build a large tower instead. This is more rational. Uh, we don't have human resources and knowledge at local levels. We, we lost this in modernization and contemporary architecture techniques. We lost the know-how how to do restoration. And we have very weak legal uh, protection. Of course, in post Oslo, even with that uh, uh, gloomy uh, uh, description, there are still some initiatives that brings light to, uh, to the end of the tunnel. So this is uh, the wall which was built on Palestine, creating a new uh, geopolitical reality. Uh, this uh, wall is not on the borders of the West Bank, rather it is getting inside the West Bank, creating uh, annexation and taking over Palestine. So what we can characterize Palestine as a geography and demography or whatever say uh, from 100 years ago is Palestine is shrinking while Israel is expanding. And this could be like a, a slogan or propaganda or whatever, but this is real in Palestine. We live it, we live it every day. 
We have walls, real walls. We have confiscations, demolitions, arrests, uh, injuries, and people. Uh, we have currently 6,000 uh, intellectual people are in prison. So this is the wall. Palestinians are on both sides of the wall. And this is where I live in Kufar Aqab, the informal city of Kufar Aqab, which is inside Israel, but outside the security of Israel. So it's complicated. I will not explain it a lot. And we have hundreds of checkpoints. And this is one of the main checkpoints at Kalandia that we have to pass if we want to go to pray in the first image. I mean, the Aqsa Mosque. So let me talk about the colonial legacy and post-colonial discourse. Our heritage is defined by a British colonial law of 1929. That heritage law defines heritage as anything which was built before 1700. Evidently, who drafted that law does not care about the living heritage, about the 300 years, the last 300 years, which constituted most of our villages or most of our uh, livelihood, crafts, and so on. So this is why buildings built before 100 years or 150 years are not protected. And therefore, this is an, not an Israeli bulldozer, but Palestinian developmentalist approach to heritage, 1920 building destroyed to have a high-rise building. This Ramallah was before the earthquake of 1927, probably this 1911 image, uh, when you have these two, three floors buildings, and suddenly we have this kind of Ramallah, very nice picturesque skyline. And so Riwak is not concentrating the work on uh, towns and cities, because I think we lost the battle there. And we turned our face to the rural Palestine, which we believe that this is the resource that we have to turn it into something really concrete. I'm not following the uh, approach, but there is something in the rural Palestine that if we take care of it, can be uh, an important lever for development in Palestine. So the rural Palestine rework works there because it's not protected, uncared for, unrecognized an asset, and mostly abandoned because we want to live in concrete houses. And it is home of the poor. And the ownership problems, some houses are owned by the whole village. So you cannot intervene, destroying or renovating. And so you leave it to the God. When they send some more water, we will be flooded and the houses will crumble. So what, what Rewak did, Rewak founded in 1991, and we believe that we progressed as the problems progressed. So uh, we, have, we, are, we, we say that we are pragmatic, and we are provocative, or pro proactive, and we are responsive because we believe in our people and we have to know what is uh, good for them and what is for, good for us and for our uh, environment and economy. So the beginnings was is to document and modeling, document the heritage and modeling restoration. So this is one of the early books of drafting um, the concrete or the terrazzo tiles in Palestine. And then we started the larger project that I entered Rewak at in 1994, which is the registry. So the registry usually is a government issue, but we did the national registry in Palestine. We went to every home, a historic house in Palestine, registered 50,000 uh, 320 historic buildings in 422 villages and towns. This was published in 2006, and it becomes our database for future interventions. But people, they don't believe in papers and uh, drawings and so on, and archives even. And they want us to see, to see some, some real stuff. And so we started a project called Job Creation Through Restoration, because they even did not believe in restoration. But when you say job creation, they believed in it. Even the donor community believed in it. So we renovated more than for 140 community centers in more than 80 villages and 20 uh, towns. We created, I think, more than 700,000 working days. So the, we uh, converted the whole discourse of heritage into what makes people happy. Really, the life, the, the, the crafts, the, the money that the, the house will bring them at the end of the, the day. This is one of these examples, this Kaid Palace in Sebastia, North uh, Nablus becomes a women's center and a small hostel where it hosts activities. Uh, Nalin Palace, which becomes uh, a place for educating educators after renovation. Sheikh Khalil Women's Center and uh, Municipal Council premises, North 
near Naples, renovated, becomes stable and safe environment for living. Kamanjati, who has been educating music for everybody in Palestine so far, they educated more than 10,000 musicians in this premise in, in Ramallah and other premises that we renovated all over Palestine. One of the buildings in Gaza was the uh, George, uh, St. George Monastery, which becomes uh, the only library in uh, a book place where you can have books in Gaza. It's 1,400 years old becomes a place where more than 50,000 kids visit this place uh, to get books. So this is part of our projects. This is in Birzeit, which won the Aga Khan project, literally a dumb place, which becomes a cultural hub. This is how it is after renovation, how the building looks like in the, in, inside and so on. And our restorations are some, some basics, but also some very uh, sophisticated mural buildings and uh, other issues. So, but we renovated eight to 12 buildings a year and we calculated that we have more than 25,000 buildings in need of restoration. So we turned our face from renovating single buildings into a large scale projects called the 50 uh, village regeneration project. If we renovate these 50 villages, we will be able to protect 50% of our heritage. So it's a pragmatic way of dealing with a large national question. Also, we started with a building, we started then villages, then more than one village at once clustering and trying to do uh, these open spaces. This is Betixa village, very uh, surrounded with all the settlements around the bit. This is after renovation, creating women's center, creating a place for kids. This is the women's center after renovation. And even we're trying to tackle different villages together now is start to stitch these villages together because we believe that there were relations among these villages and they were cut by the wall and other means. So we try to recreate them by creating the interdependency of these villages on each other, which means create cultural center in one place that serves the whole thing. Create a women's center that serves the whole villages. and almost obliging people to move and to overcome the colonial fragmentation policies. So this is the places where you know, renovated, lots of people come to them and it becomes safe. This is the most important centers, especially women. We do lots of things with women and kids. And then we have the other Nakba of our heritage in 2018, the new law came to power and this law protects anything before 19. Uh, 1917. So it's not, uh, it's not 1700 now, it is 1917. And we don't know why they created this uh, period point. What is the difference between 1917 from heritage point of view, 1918 or 1919, we don't know. It is this, how it created what we call it a suicide. So this is the Palestinian emblem. And this is what we think we are really putting a bullet in our head because this law does not protect all the things that we can claim also, like the British colonial uh, architecture, which is starting with the modern, this is Barclays Bank in Jerusalem, all, or the telecommunication stuff, the museum, our museum is not protected even, the Rockefeller Museum, the industrial architecture is not protected. So this is why we call it uh, suicide. This is Elias of Modern Architecture from Lebanon who contributed the Alhamra Palace in, uh, in 1937 to Jaffa also, it's not protected. Many things like the airport of 1930s, airport, the Kalandia, uh, airport or the Quds airport, all the Tigert buildings were created between 1938 and 1942 to combat the, the revolution in Palestine, also not protected. Even uh, uh, simple houses, which was built, this one case in Jibin, uh, built in 1919 with international uh, style, but we cannot claim or we cannot protect Salame House. It's 1930s with no capitals for the columns. This is a new way of dealing with, uh, with structures. It's not protected. Also the refugee camps, which, which came about in the morning. This is a refugee camp that I did my study of Jalazon refugee camp 1950. And this is how it is now. And if we think modernity about rationalism and functionalism and material, 
what you have it. This is it. And I think there is an opportunity to, to protect it. And this is why I appreciate uh, Alessandro and Sandri's work. Many architectural forms emerged in 1930s and 40s and up to the 60s in Palestine, like these hotels, Capital Hotel, King Hussein House, which is unfinished in Beit Hanina, also there. King Hussein Residence, which is Darul Qutub, designed by Sayyid Karim, also the one on the left is not protected. We have too many architecture uh, elements in Ramallah. Salti Fani Arafat, who was educated in King Fuad, uh, Egyptian uh, uh, University. All these buildings are not protected. But, but let's see what's renovation, just because we don't renovate modern architecture in Rewap. This is just to put it bluntly. But we are critical to reducing it to rubble. Okay, for instance, this is the Ramallah municipality designed by Reza Khouri, uh, educated in AUB. And this is the new project of it by a famous Palestinian architect, Charlie Dace. But this does not have any relation to the original scheme of the building. <clears throat> Rewak, when we intervene in villages and towns, we have many uh, modern elements or concrete elements we try to protect, like the one on the left, which is a veranda, a concrete veranda. We kept it and even we renovated it. It's easier to renovate the concrete than the historic building. So it's our take is to keep whatever we find on the site, even if we don't like it from aesthetic point of view or from heritage point of view, because we believe it belongs to the past, but also it belongs to the future. One example is this building that we managed to salvage, 1960s Ramallah uh, house, which becomes a kindergarten. So we were happy to renovate as such and keep it for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Khaldun. Uh, our next speaker is Siegfried Enders from ECOMOS. Uh, his uh, talk will be about international cooperation in the preservation and restoration of cultural monuments, the role of ECOMOS and other NGOs. Uh, Mr. Enders studied architecture and urban planning at the TU Darmstadt. From 72 to 76, he first learned Japanese at the University of Foreign Languages in Osaka on a DAAD scholarship, and then studied architecture at the University of Kyoto. His dissertation, Japanese Housing Forms and Their Changes, was published in 1979. After his return to Germany, he worked for 30 years in urban planning and the preservation of monuments in Hessen. And since 2009, he has been president of the International Council on Monuments and Site, ECOMOS, one of the three advisory institutions of the UNESCO World Heritage Commission. The floor is yours, Mr. Anders. Hello and good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me um, to this workshop. One moment. I'd like to congratulate you for producing this important publication and organizing this symposium. Both fully correspond to our ideas of how to promote awareness of the preservation and conservation. And in this case of a very important building culture, the architecture of the 20th century in the Arab world. I was asked as a representative of a scientific committee of ICOMOS to give you some information about who contributes, which competencies and resources in the field of heritage preservation and what can international cooperation do to preserve monuments. I'm afraid I can do this only out of my experience at ICOMOS and not so much out of those of other international NGOs. But I guess I will be, it will be similar there. ECOMOS is one of the global 
players within the heritage preservation issue. Its main task and value is the creation and utilization of networks and rising awareness for the task linked with preservation, conservation, restoration of cultural monuments. By doing research, evaluation, helping with restoration and conservation of built heritage and heritage management, legal aspects and financing. This is done by spreading of information and raising awareness via publications, the official website of ICOMOS and social media and face-to-face -face via workshops, seminars, symposiums, conferences, heritage days and so on what many other NGOs do as well. So cooperation with partners like heritage NGOs, universities and research institutes, governmental institutions, UNESCO World Heritage Committee, Europa Nostra, for instance, Docomomo and heritage owners and so on is essential for ECOMOS and necessary. For those who are not familiar with ICOMOS, a brief explanation of this Global Acting Heritage Organization. ICOMOS, the International Council of Monuments and Sites is a non-governmental international organization dedicated to the conservation of the world's monuments and sites. It was founded to be an advisory body of the UNESCO World Heritage Committee for the implementation of the World Heritage Conven uh, Convention of UNESCO. ICOMOS has established 29 scientific committees on various cultural heritage themes and issues. Members consist of internationally renowned expert specialists in each subject and designated by their own national committee there are ECOMOS technical bodies and undertake research, development, conservation theory, guidelines and charters, and foster training for better heritage conservation, promote international exchange of scientific information and carry out common projects. I'm sorry to interrupt you, maybe just a question. Um, did you want us to be sharing the presentation? Yes. Yeah, okay. I think because it's not being shared now, but we will project it. Oh, wait a moment. Sorry about that. Um, if it's easier, we could also share it from here. Yeah, maybe. Uh, Siegfried, you just have to press F five, and then we you we see it. We already see it. It's fine. Um, maybe you can go ahead, Mr. Anders. Go ahead without the Thank slides. You. If they manage to run them from here, it's fine. But you're, what you're saying is very clear. Thank you. I think maybe you're muted.
Yeah, the mute button is on. Yeah, perfect. Wigfried, uh, you can go on. Um, we will share your presentation from here. Okay. So I start from the beginning or I just go? No, no, no. I think you can go forward. Okay. Um, I was introducing ICOMOS. Um, and I was talking about the 29th uh, scientific committees. Um, ICOMOS has established 29 scientific committees on various cultural heritage, and they are um, the bodies, the technical bodies of ICOMOS. They do research, develop conservation theories, guidelines, and uh, charters, enforce a training for better heritage conservation, promote international exchange and scientific information, and carry out common projects. The following committees in particular work to preserve built cultural assets with respective emphasis on specific aspects on the, of the committee. Um, there are some doing about um, theory analysis and about restoration. There are some doing uh, dealing with uh, material and um, with documentation and with building types and urban planning and finally for legal and financing advice. Who contributes which competencies and resources? The next one. ECOMOS members act as evaluators, for instance, of application for the listing of World Heritage. They act in UNESCO World Heritage Monitoring Groups to advise, control, and report about the treatment of World Heritage. They act as experts for private and governmental institutions in the field of conservation, restoration, and preservation. And they do this voluntarily and without fee. Their competence is only given advice without any legal competences. Their resources are their expertise out of their special knowledge in an international comparison. ICOMOS as an NGO has no financial resources to support the preservation of built heritage. However, due to the experience and knowledge of their members, there could be an advice for financial management and heritage preservation. What are the ways for ECOMOS to influence the preservation and of built heritage and the working methods? Mainly dissemination of information on results in historical heritage building research, heritage restoration techniques, heritage material science, heritage conservation management, and publications about cooperation with research institutes, universities, conferences, symposia, and study tours. And uh, there is a special case, which is a publication on heritage at risk. And on-site advice on conservation and restoration projects of built heritage. Here I show you some uh, examples for publication about conferences and symposia, and um, then about this um, examples for a special issue is the Heritage at Risk. Heritage at Risk program was endorsed by ICOMOS members in 1999. The aim of these reports is to identify threatened heritage places monuments and sites, present typical cases, studies and trends, and share suggestions for solving individual or global threats to our cultural heritage. This is published nearly every year. Next page. There was a special um, example for um, other activities like, for instance, study tours, 
So for instance, this um, uh, scientific committee I was heading um, for shared built heritage, they do every year um, study tour somewhere um, in the world. And uh, nine, 2019, for instance, we organized a study tour in, in Morocco together with ICOMOS Morocco. And in nearly each city we visited, we had a guided tour, a symposium, a workshop on the preservation and shared built heritage with our local partners, who are universities, heritage institutions, local governments and heritage administrations. And we could share and exchange our experience in preserving it. Next, please. In the Arab world, ECOMOS activities are mainly done by the national committees. And we have uh, in 12 countries, uh, national committees. And there are some publication on uh, the architecture, mainly the world heritage in the Arab region, one from 2020 and one from 2004. And next please. There are corporations also in the Arab world. There is a co cooperation with the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage. And these are workshops on world heritage in Arab countries, and they uh, mainly deal with uh, the listing of the buildings and how to do it. I hope I could give you a brief overview. I'm sorry about this uh, technical problems. And if you feel like uh, that using the international profession the reputation of e-commerce, especially as an advisor to UNESCO, could also be helpful for you in assess, asserting your special concern in relation to the preservation of built heritage. You are invited to join your national e-commerce committee. And you can get more information on the official website of e-commerce. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, our, our final presentation is titled Recycle, Repurpose, Reuse, Renew and Conserve, A Future for Our Modern Heritage. Our presenter is Susan McDonald. Susan McDonald trained as an architect in Australia and has worked in the government, private and non-profit sector in the UK and internationally as head buildings and sites at the Getty Conservation Institute. Institute. She has a particular interest in conserving modern heritage and has written extensively on the subject. She is a vice president for the ECOMOS 20th century and is a member of Docomomo Technology and oversees the GCI's Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative. I hand it over to Susan. Um, thank you so much. Um, I hope my slide is, uh, maybe I need to swap my displays or are you seeing my full screen? It's being, yeah, I mean, it's being shared now, the presentation, we see it. Okay, so you're seeing my full screen though, right? Yes. No, no, yeah, okay, not my notes, all right. Great, thank you. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this forum. Um, and congratulations so much on this incredible uh, and very important book. Um, I feel very humbled to be to be with you all. Uh, my knowledge and experience in of modernity in the Arab world is uh, nascent. Um, Susan? So, um, yes. Sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I think we still see the view with the notes. I think you need to... Okay. How's that? Yeah, just press start on the presentation. I think it should work. Okay. Is that better now? No. Okay. Maybe play start from again. start. I think it's a yeah, yeah. Yes. I'll do that. Sorry. Perfect. Yeah. Um, it worked out for one second and then, <laughs> then it was gone. Again. Okay. I probably went too quickly. All right. <clears throat> Stop share. Let me start again.
Is that better? Not yet. Not yet. I'm so sorry. My computer crashed in the middle of this event. And I had to... Um... Oops. Sorry. Stop share. I'll try one more time. I'm so sorry. I had a technical problem with my laptop today. And Okay. If it doesn't work, it's also very clear still. It works, it works, great. Hey, yay, okay. Okay, let me start again. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so the Getty Conservation Institute has had a long interest in the modern heritage. And in 2013, we launched the Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative with the aim of advancing the conservation of modern heritage internationally. And this was a long-standing initiative that was developed in response to the ongoing challenges that were facing the heritage of the modern era and as identified by key players in the field. And the premise is that this heritage is increasingly important, it's still undervalued, and that it deserves the protection and application of conservation processes, uh, as do all periods of heritage. So we recognised that in order to achieve this ambition, we really needed to increase the availability and access to um, and the use of conservation methods and standards and tools for 20th century. But we needed to do more um, research and understanding through field projects and to fill knowledge and information gaps and through training, um, all with its aim of um, trying to improve practice to get better conservation outcomes for this heritage. So our research work um, is really organised under four different themes. Uh, historical research, what do we have? Why is it important? And what do we want to keep? And one of the things that we did in partnership with the ICOMOS IOC 20 was to create this um, 20th century historic thematic framework as a tool for helping those organisations and places that are trying to go through this exercise of identifying um, what's important that represents their history uh, from the modern era. Um, the second area of research relates to philosophical and methodological questions. How do we apply conservation approaches for modern heritage? Then there's technical research about understanding modern materials and systems and how to conserve them. And then we do work on the state of conservation um, for modern heritage and what might the needs be for the field. Uh, we also work through um, field projects, which helps us to understand some of the problems and develop solutions that might be site specific, but might have broader application. Um, and we've been working at the House of Rand Charles Eames and the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in California and the Chandigarh Government Museum in, um, in India. Uh, in creating and disseminating information, we um, are creating a number of different bibliographies. We publish all our technical reports from our projects online. We're starting to create guidelines. We've created a new case study series to try and um, showcase projects or solutions that practitioners have had dealing with some of the challenges to dealing with modern heritage in the field. And we also publish the results of some of our convenings and research about what the needs of the field are um, to help others. Um, our training work, um, we've been engaged in for a number of years now, and we deliver uh, some short in-person and online courses. Uh, we're developing a long conservation course at the moment. Uh, we do topic-specific training on conservation management plans or technical issues. And we're also in the process of developing training materials that um, may be able to be helpful for others. Uh, in 2014, the Getty Foundation, and you've heard about a little bit about this today already, started a companion program to provide funding for conservation projects that demonstrated the application of conservation methodologies, uh, either conservation plans 
or perhaps the sort of technical research or investigation that needs to be done. And this was based on the premise that owners often don't recognize the need for this. It's very hard to get funding for this type of work for modern heritage. And the program has now funded uh, over 75 projects in 40 different countries, including um, three from the Arab world. Um, but coming now to the title of my talk, um, which attempts to uh, share some thoughts on how we might deal with the, de the legacy of this modern era in ways that preserves culturally significant places, but also meets greater society goals of sustainable development and response to climate change. Um, modern building stock generally, and some modern heritage as well, has sometimes been accused not always in a justified way of being guilty of conflicting with some of these broader states, these broader societal aims of sustainability or um, environmental um, sustainability specifically. And that's due to some of these very um, specific challenges for modern heritage. We've heard a little bit about uh, sometimes the materials and the construction techniques result in shorter lifespans. Um, sometimes these buildings were built to to serve a very specific purpose, which may now be defunct. And, um, and the issue is that there's so much, in many, there's so much of this um, built legacy in many parts of the world, much of the building stock dates from the 20th century or even the second half of it. So this is something that really comes to the fore when we think about concrete heritage, which is increasingly being recognized as heritage value, but is also increasingly under threat. It's one of the most common building materials of the 20th century. And therefore I sort of used it to sort of pose my, um, the, the next few slides and some of the ideas that, that I'm gonna share. So concrete, uh, one of the most common building materials, as I, as I mentioned, but also increasingly seen as the pariah of the construction industry, both in terms of the past legacy and in terms of the future use of it. So we need to be thinking about where might conservation fit in dealing with the legacy of this vast swaths of the Earth's built environment of which are constructed of materials like concrete. So... I think this means that we really need to be thinking about expanding the toolkit for how we deal with this legacy in ways that are appropriate environmentally and that contribute to these broader sustainable development goals, which are now an imperative in many different parts of the world. And we need to use these full range of options for our concrete heritage, regardless of their heritage status. Um, and this is everything from recycling, repurpose, reuse, renew, and sometimes conservation. And which approach will be used is going to be dependent on how important the place is and what's important about it. So for those places that have been identified as being culturally significant, the approach obviously needs to be one where conservation comes to the fore and we work to sustain what's important about that place and observe these broader uh, societal needs um, and manage the, the knowledge and the skills and the money that we have available to do that particular work. So if I take this one by one very quickly, so for places where there may be no cultural significance has been identified in, in the fabric or the form of the building, um, perhaps recycling is a position that we can take. And I think this is a really interesting example from Korea, the Hanil Cement Company Visitor Center and Guest House, where they've recycled concrete from the site, other buildings on the site, um, illustrating the range of different ways that concrete can be reused uh, on this uh, site, which is adjacent to a national park, so of environmental sensitivity. Um, in those places um, that um, where reuse or repurposing might, might be a suitable option, where the social or historic value might be important, but um, they may have less, uh, the use may be defunct now. Um, and so only perhaps the form or some of the aspects of it may be able to be retained. And this is the Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art in South Africa, which repurposes this very monumental uh, former grain silo into a museum. And there are options for renew. Uh, this example of renewal on a large urban scale is from Toronto, an increasingly an interesting option, I think, that tackles a multitude of societal values, environmental values, 
along with some of the heritage related values of urban value, uh, landscape values and social values, but recognizing that um, perhaps the material authenticity uh, may be less important when we look at some of these larger, um, larger values or, la or larger imperatives. And then we get to conservation for those places that have been identified to be of cultural significance and host to multiple values. Uh, the Barbican Estate in London is one of these, which has um, architectural value, historic value, urban value, landscape value, and social value. And this place has extensive conservation planning documents and policies that guide change and ongoing stewardship to preserve these multitude, multitude of values to a much more rigorous degree, including the material authenticity and those material characteristics and qualities as well. So um, thank you. Um, I know that none of these examples are from the Arab world, but I think uh, many of the issues are of equal relevance given the depth and the breadth of the um, modern era's architecture that's been celebrated here over the last two days and the greater recognition of how we might need to balance these multiplicity of values that are now recognized as being important. Um, so I know that this is a very quick um, thesis uh, on something that's quite um, complex, but I was just hoping to end this in a provocative way, hopefully not too superficially. Uh, and there's some of my image credits. And again, thank you very much for inviting me to be with you. Thank you, Susan. Thank, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, I propose, if you don't mind, to start with the questions uh, from the audience. There were some hands raised in the first uh, part, so we don't want to miss on these. Uh, do we have a microphone for Amin? And I think the second was uh, Jens. Um, thank you, everyone, for great presentations. Um, Khaldun, all I can say is that's it. <laughs> um, my question is for Aziza, actually. Um, Aziza, I love and respect your work so much. I can't even, you know, begin to express my feelings here. Um, you know, the, the question of the violence of modernism is nothing specific to Morocco, right? There's so many examples out there, but I really appreciate you bringing it up. I think one of the most famous examples is Chandigarh. When you go there, you know, looking for Le Corbusier and, and, and company, you discover all the um, uh, slums uh, that were created by the displacement of these people. Um, watching your presentation and then the um, video that you shared afterwards, which was amazing. Um, all I kept thinking of is the same woman that George brought up, Zahra. Um, and I, I keep wondering what would be the equivalent of that hip hop video for Zahra's community? Like, how do you really, I guess you can't displace them back, you know, you can't bring them back to the site, but how do you genuinely engage them? I, I feel you have the sensitivity and the good intentions, but how do you engage people like Zahra who might be more kind of conservative you know, and might not actually ever use the spa. Um, how do you engage them? How do you, how do you make them feel that they're actually invested and, and part of this site, which is really theirs? Um, thank you. It's a very good question. Um, you know, like somebody like Zahra, I mean, they're really the minority. There are only few people, I would say three people that are her age that were young when they were displaced. But let's say that this feeling of, you know, uh, this violent feeling that something was taken from them, was passed down from generation to, to generation. But the younger, I, th I think for Zahra is feeling that her family is getting something back in return. And the fact that, you know, her son, her grandchildren uh, were part of this project. So her granddaughter is the swimming teacher in, in the pool and she became one of the tour guides and she was part of all of the workshops and they took part in the hip hop, um, you know, like the, her grandchildren took part in the hip hop workshops that were done and in the creation of the choreography because the choreography and the music were written while the artists went on in residency. So, but it was, we didn't want to do something that would exclude them, but it was very interesting to see uh, youth from the shanty towns of Casablanca that were dancers in the Ishtah 
program come for the first time to Sidi Harazem, meet with the youth of Sidi Harazem and discover it through their eyes. Uh, so, so let's say that to, to, to answer your question, there is nothing that could return the old city Harazem to the population. But what I didn't also talk about, didn't have time, but for me was very central is in creating this, you know, art walk. Uh, the art walk starts in the village, the village of Schinet. It was very important for us, for an artist to have intervened there. And we're very lucky to get this amazing artist, Yasin Bilbziwi, who proposed to do a mural, but to also do a play um, that he's gonna write with a musician that plays the flute. And, we're, and he's gonna do a walk, almost like a procession, which was to reconcile in a way the villagers with Sidi Harazim. So going from the village all the way to Sidi Harazim and have also an intervention in Sidi Harazim. So uh, in a sense, uh, through the different actions that, that we are leading, but also with the, um, I was telling you like the very symbolical move that the first part of the rehabilitation that we started in November, 2020, so one month before COVID hit, was to create those kiosks for the inhabitants of Sidi Harazim that were in a way having this you know, informal market. It was very important to prove that we're, we're providing something for them while we are building the, 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 the new market. So I think this question of trust has to do with time, with building relationships, and but most importantly, integrating the, the population in the making of the future, because this station now is gonna be theirs before they felt completely not you know, integrated in its making. So I don't know if it will succeed, we'll see. Thank you very much for all of you uh, this afternoon and this morning and yesterday. I have a perhaps more of a reflection. I see a, an interesting paradox and I wonder how architects who are engaged in renovation but also in, in conservation um, react to it. So, we are, as all of us who are interested in the modernist, modernist architecture and try to show its, uh, its incredible richness, um, we, on the one hand, we are celebrating individual architects who made possible these buildings because of their special relationship to the state. So at the national level, the state level. Fast forward to 2022, and I guess for a while now, what activists and architects who are, you know, committed architects to the heritage are doing, they're challenged by the state. The state is no longer, no longer gives us or, or you um, uh, a leg up. In fact, you have to organize yourselves around the state. The very, the very level of, of, of institutions that made possible, the buildings that we are now trying to protect. And what we're doing is we're hoping, like Mona Halak and other people, it was obvious also with uh, Aziza, we're looking at the municipal level. So if we do a sort of a cold analysis is that our projects for, for rehabilitation probably work best if there's a um, a functioning and an autonomous municipal level of governance. And so it's when there's a bottom up, a grassroots push towards preserving, you know, what Riwak does in, in Palestine and, you know, other activists in other places, a bottom up push with the backing of, a, of an independent and a, a locally powerful municipality is more likely to succeed uh, than a situation where there's a weak municipality or some lower level of governance. Um, so I guess it's 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 a, I guess a strategic question. I'm coming to realize uh, now. Um, we can't afford to circumvent the state, but the state is no longer the ally that it was um, back at the moment of construction. Right, and how do we incorporate this to our strategizing? Right, I mean, on the one hand, not without offending the state, as it were, but also to perhaps support um, local level of, of 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 government in some in some form or or, or shape or form. Because it seems to me that that nexus decides perhaps success and 
failure if you want. So it's just a sort of reflection on strategy. Yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. This, this is the way to operate. This is where you can make, uh, make a difference, certainly. It's very well, well taken. Um, if there is no question, just one, one question to uh, Susan. Uh, my question is, is the Keeping It Modern uh, program uh, still running or is it stopped? Was it interrupted? And uh, is there, if it was interrupted, uh, is there a way to uh, reinstall it somehow or not? Um, well, the, um, the short answer is that uh, last year was the last year of the Keeping It Modern grant um, program. So um, it is not continuing on an international basis. There are no plans to do that at the moment, sadly. Um, the, all the work that has done from that particular network of people is available, all their reports and their work is shared up on the Keeping Up Modern website. So if you're interested to look at that, I encourage you to do that. But that's not really, I think, don't think the question, what you're looking for is what are their options for longer term funding? And um, I'm afraid I can't be positive on that note. Um, I would say that the um, Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative is continuing. Uh, we've had 10 years of that program and we're just starting to think about what the next 10 years might be and, can, and how can we strategically support the field. But, you know, I acknowledge that at the heart of your question is how do we sometimes get the seed money that might be needed to address some of those issues? And the last question was a particularly interesting one because we do see that this handover of national or, or state government buildings um, that were so uh, that so many were created in at this period in the middle of this 20th century particularly now being sold off um, given to local government without the responsibility of helping to find uses and funding for them so it is a particular it is a particular challenge and I'm sorry I can't be more positive about keeping keeping it modern grants keeping on going. Um, you, you could always lobby, uh, but, but uh, you know, I think that um, uh, clearly there is an interest and a need for, for that work. But um, I think the idea was to do this particular work for a number of years because there are so many needs out there in the field on so many different projects. And uh, it was hoping that it might demonstrate the importance of what such funding can do to try and generate um, that self-support from those institutions that do actually have responsibility for some of this work. It's, it's, thank you. Just a very quick remark by uh, Aziza. I think we, we should to... start a lobbying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like, especially, I just wanted to say that in the particular case of Morocco, what the Keeping It Modern program did, that was a turning point for the Moroccan government, because what you've seen was a conservation, a conservation management plan. But as soon as I was done, the government hired us to actually do the plans for the rehabilitation. We started right before COVID, unfortunately, but hopefully it will continue. But it was when the, they invited the architect and the client, which was the government, to come to London for a workshop. And that was actually turning, it opened the eyes of the Moroccan government when we visited the Barbican and when we visited you know, for other projects, they saw what, that modern heritage could be monetized in a certain way. So we saw dollar signs in their eyes uh, suddenly, but that changed really their attitude. They saw something very ugly, no matter what I told them, no matter what the grant came in, and it was very important and uh, uh, prestigious, but seeing uh, very relevant and successful projects of modern heritage rehabilitation made a very big difference. Um, anyway, so the, this program, I feel even if it's in a smaller capacity, but the seed support, and I think the network have been so instrumental in, in changing at least the field of modern heritage preservation in Morocco. So thank you. Okay, if, if you don't mind, <laughs> we will stop with this very positive uh, note and we will uh, convene again at six. We have a book to launch and uh, it's been a long day and I hope all of you can stay with us uh, for the book launch and the respondents and the discussion we may have about it. Thank you very much. <laughs>